Hello, Bedford. I'm Jerry Hanauer. I'm your host for today's edition of Candidates Corner, BCTV's service to the community where you get to meet your candidates firsthand. And today's guest is a candidate for executive council, uh, Gray Chinawith. Gray, thanks for coming here to hey. BCTV. Jerry, thanks, thanks for having me. It's always great to be in Bedford. Ah. Uh, so uh, I want to talk about the Executive Council, which few people understand and is mm. among the most powerful offices in the state. Uh, but I do want to get into your uh, personal uh, background first. So you're a native of New Hampshire. Uh, I think you grew up maybe in Manchester, but you live in Manchester now. So you got a couple of kids. You're raising a family. Your yep. wife Tara. Tell us about your tell us about your personal uh, story here. Yeah. So <clears throat> you know we'll, we'll we'll talk about the personal first, and then we'll get into the professional later on. All right. Uh, so I grew up in. I was born to a house in Manchester, right by uh, McIntyre Ski Area, uh, and then uh, quickly moved to Canterbury, New Hampshire, which is a small town, uh, around three thousand people uh, up north of Concord. Uh, where I grew up. I went to Belmont High School for a couple years, and then I went to Bishop Brady, uh, where I graduated for a couple years. Um, and then uh, right now, I live with uh, my wife, Tara, and our two boys, uh, Graham and Lincoln. And uh, it's, it's a, you know, New Hampshire has offered so much opportunity for me, and I really do feel blessed uh, to have two great boys and a wonderful wife. Uh, and uh, in, in living in a community that really has so many assets, right? I mean, I think one of the reasons that I love New Hampshire uh, and came back here to launch my career and my, my family is because we have so much in the state, right? We have access to urban areas like Boston. We have access to the North Country and skiing and hiking. We could have access to the, to the seacoast. So it's just a great place to be, <clears throat> you know, and, and uh, there's no better place to be than the 603, right? Uh, that's, that's what I love. You know, uh, you've had a remarkably varied career, which shows a wide range of interests and a wide range of talents, really. Uh, you started out uh, in college. I think you have uh, uh, two degrees from Duke University, perhaps? Uh, I do. Yeah, so, uh, so I, you know, wanted to explore the world a little bit and went from a, a small town in Canterbury to a very, very different place in uh, Berkeley, California, near San Francisco. Uh, where I got an undergraduate degree in political science, oh. uh, which was a great time. I was very involved on campus uh, and very involved in, in, in the community there. And then I uh, decided that, uh, you know, I was ready for a change from Berkeley in the Bay Area. So I then went to, uh, to Duke University, uh, North Carolina, where my grandmother spent, I went, visited a lot there growing up. Uh, and I just wanted to, you know, get, get to experience the South, uh, see some Duke Blue Devil basketball games. And I certainly got that. I went to all three uh, Duke UNC games while I was in uh, while I was at uh, in Durham at Duke, and boy, those are memorable experiences. Got to see Coach K uh, on the sidelines. I uh, camped out for tickets, so got a wonderful experience. Uh, but ultimately decided that you know California has its pluses. Uh, certainly North Carolina has its pluses, where I got the law degree and the master's in public policy. Uh, but really knew that I wanted to be in New Hampshire uh, mm -hmm. just because I saw such a huge amount of opportunity and I knew it was such a great place to, to live and, uh, and grow up. And so, you know, I was the first, as far as I can tell, uh, and what the career office has told me, I was the first person ever to graduate from Duke uh, and then start my law career in New Hampshire, which I thought made complete sense, but they, they looked at me a little funny because most of the Duke grads, they end up in New York or DC. Uh, but I knew that New Hampshire was where I wanted to be. And you were a corporate attorney uh, in, in town for a while. Uh, but uh, it seems as if you uh, have so many interests that they're always pulling you to uh, something more and more, maybe more and more complex, more technical. Uh, tell us about your career. You can start with uh, being a corporate lawyer. You can uh, go on to, to your career in Dine. Uh, talk about that. Yeah, sure. Well, <clears throat> I have to say, uh, you're right. My experience has been pretty varied. Uh, I started off at a great law firm, uh, Sheen Finney Bass and Green, mm -hmm. and was thrilled. There's a great lawyers there, uh, local Kate Hanna, who's a lawyer, uh, sure uh, uh, Bedford resident, and a lot of great folks uh, from from uh, Manchester and Bedford and the surrounding area at Sheen Finney. And and the thing that attracted me to it is that they have this great blend of uh, knowing that the best way to get known as a lawyer in the community is to be involved in the community. And that great business development and uh, comes from letting people see you operate on community boards 
and on profit boards and, and in the community. And so very quickly after I started there working with, uh, with a, uh, on the corporate side with Sue Manchester and Ken Viscarello and uh, Bruce Harwood and Kate Hanna, uh, I, you know, I started to do real estate law, started to do corporate law. And, and just get involved in the community. That's where I was able to, to found an organization called the Manchester Young Professionals Network, which was really key for me because one of the unique parts about coming back to New Hampshire was that you know, the loneliest birthday I ever spent was uh, June 29th, 2004. And the reason it was lonely is because you know, I moved back, but none of my friends did. Oh, yeah. And so it, it was unique. I, I celebrated with, uh, with a few friends that I had met while I was studying for the bar. But it was, you know, I said, how can this be? You know, how, how can it be that we, uh, you know, great kids grow up here, but they don't stay here to launch their careers? And how can that work for our economy? And, and how can I meet friends, right? So I ended up, uh, we started uh, Manchester Young Professionals Network, and that started to attract hundreds and thousands of people uh, to our meetings because they wanted to feel that sense of community. And that was just the first way that I started to get involved in the community and, and opened my eyes up to this big challenge that New Hampshire faces, which is this demographic challenge. We are uh, an old state and getting older. And, uh, and what that means is that we've got to, to ensure that we have great economic opportunity uh, and that the state has a viable economic engine. Uh, we need to make sure that we're recruiting and retaining the next generation of New Hampshire workers, which I've spent a lot of time thinking about, but I felt that first night, uh, that first birthday back in New Hampshire after I came back. So, so I went and did uh, three years as, uh, as a corporate attorney, uh, which was fantastic. A lot Worked on lots of real estate deals and small uh, M&A transactions, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, and then one of my clients that I had met through this program called Leadership Manchester uh, said, hey, let's cut out the middleman. Why don't you just come work for me? And I said, well, you know, this, I had a pretty good gig going at, at Sheen Finney, and they're a great law firm. But uh, that was Jeremy Hitchcock, who grew up in Bedford. Oh, yeah. and, uh, and he was growing, at that point, 10, 15 people, a company called Dine. Uh, and I said, boy, this seems like a really exciting company. Jeremy seems like a really tremendous leader. And I said, you know what? The time is right. I'm going to get out of the law, and I'm going to go in-house. Where... And so I was at Dine from about... 15 people uh, until we were about 450 or 500. And I had a huge variety of roles. I started off as a lawyer, but then I quickly uh, moved on to you know, running HR and running uh, finance and doing corporate development. We raised uh, more than $50 million in venture capital. Uh, we you know, ha- opened up operations around the globe. And all that time as, as the chief operating officer, I really got to participate in so many different things. My, my last job there was running the engineering department. So I had no technical experience as a software engineer, but over the time I learned how to work with people. I learned how to organize ourselves so that we can go accomplish goals. Uh, I I knew how to work with and coach up teams of of large groups of people and work with executives and hire them. So it it was was a fabulous experience uh, and one I wouldn't trade for the world. And, And we ended up doing a pretty good job because, you know, Oracle came in and bought and bought Dyn. Uh, and it's still growing and thriving in the mill yard, which we're excited about, uh, you know, generating hundreds of great paying jobs uh, and really being a, a stalwart in the, in the, in the, you know, our business community here, uh, driving innovation, uh, bringing more people together, bringing young people into the city uh, and into Bedford and into surrounding towns. So it was a really exciting, really exciting time. Uh, the mill yard is becoming so dynamic. It's really a, a wonderful place. Uh, and... Uh, when Dine, I guess it was 2016, was bought out by Oracle, that must have been kind of a life-changing event for you in a way. I mean, it, it, it allowed you, I presume, to yeah. uh, follow your, even more strongly, your public service inclinations. It, it, it sure did, although I've been, you know, so growing up, my, my story to public service really starts with my dad. And I, I mentioned that I went from, I spent two years at Belmont High School and then two years at Bishop Brady. Uh-huh. And the reason I made that shift was because uh, in my sophomore year, my dad got a letter uh, from the accreditation body for, the, for New England that said Belmont was about to lose its accreditation because we hadn't built a school in 50 years, and there was a real risk that uh, you know, it, wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't meet standards. And so then I might not be able to get my diploma accepted uh, out of college. So uh, he was pretty frustrated with that. He'd paid a lot of tax dollars and wasn't able to get a degree that he thought would be uh, worth it. And so we ended up, I ended up going to Bishop Brady where I had a great time. Yeah. But yeah. what he did next, I think, is really the way that New Hampshire works. 
right? We have low taxes. We like it that way. And what that means is that, uh, you know, we've, we need to have uh, volunteers come into state government. People need to volunteer. So what my dad did is he volunteered, got on the school board. They built the new school. They brought in new administrators. And, and by the time my younger brother, who's 15 years younger than I am, by the time he got to Belmont High, they were winning awards. And I think that's just an example of the way that New Hampshire works is that here, you don't say it's someone else's problem. You say, I'm going to go out and change my community and make it better. And then and, your dad, he, he ran for state rep. He was a state representative. He, he was he? a state rep, exactly. He was a state rep and he ran for state senate. But, but more important than all of that, he was just very engaged. He was very engaged in our faith community. He was uh, the founder of New Hampshire Public Radio. And so, you know, just always very engaged, uh, viewed your role as a citizen in New Hampshire to be one that's active and community oriented. And, and I always brought that back with me. When, when I started my business career, that's one of the reasons I picked She and Finney because whether it's in public service or in nonprofits or just in you know, running your local uh, kids sports team, right? The way that New Hampshire works best is when people volunteer and, and give of their expertise, right? That's how New Hampshire works. Your dad, mm. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to clear something up here. Uh, you have an unusual uh, name on the ballot. It's yeah. Gray. I mean, yep. it's an easily remembered name, and that's good. Uh, but you're the you're the second of three, maybe maybe more than that, <laughs> Graham Chinawitz. So uh, I presume that you got your name Gray, so that when someone yelled out, uh, they would know how to address you in your house because there are too many uh, too yeah. many Grams around. So you became Gray. Yeah, absolutely. So my dad's name was uh, was Graham. Uh, he named me Graham, although the interesting part is that we have different middle, same middle initial, uh, different middle names. So I'm, my dad was Graham John, I'm Graham James, uh, although I, most people know me by Gray. Yeah. And uh, in honor of my father, uh, I named my first son uh, Graham Jackson. Uh -huh. So Graham Jackson Chinaweth, uh, you know, when it comes to the last name, it's a little bit hard to pronounce, but it's Chai now eth and you can just think Gray now is the time. So that's, that's, that's the way we try to carve that up, because it's a little bit long, not as easy to say. And, uh, but that's, the, that's, you know, that's my dad's legacy to me, and that's the one I wanted to pass on to my son, because I think, you know, for me, the, the name carries with it an expectation of uh, commitment to community. Absolutely. And participation in the yeah, nature. I can see that. In fact, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit more? Uh, you have so much community involvement. I know you're on some boards. You're on some philo philanthropic boards. You're on, on national uh, New Hampshire Public Radio board. You're on City Year. Your family's in transition in town. Uh, you, you really do a lot. Yeah. So, so like I said, when I first got back, it was very clear that uh, Sheehan had an expectation of being engaged in the community. Mm. And so I got to work doing that. So I joined, as I said, I founded uh, MYPN, and I later helped found uh, stay Work Play, which is also dedicated to recruiting and retaining the next generation of New Hampshire workers. But uh, it was, you know, the other boards, Families in Transition, which is an amazing organization that yeah. right now is on the front lines of the opioid crisis. But what I love about Families in Transition, what I love about uh, City Year, two organizations that I was involved with on the board, is that they're not nonprofits that view themselves in a passive way. And they're entrepreneurial, right? That's what I loved about those organizations. If if you've ever been involved with FIT or Maureen Beauregard, you know that she, she is very business-minded. And because of that, they have a very diverse revenue streams. Uh, they've got a great uh, income generator in their, in their outfitter stores. And, <clears throat> you know, I think those are just evidence of, of the great work that nonprofits can do when they open up their minds and they say, hey, how can we make a sustainable business model? So I was always very excited to participate in those. City Year was another great organization, The Courier, uh, New Hampshire Public Radio. You know, all these organizations, which I think are key to developing different parts of our community, and were really exciting for me to be a part of. And, uh, and now, you know, I'm on, uh, advise uh, some corporate boards, right? So I, I'm on, uh, I advise several startup companies. Uh, I'm on the board of uh, Primary Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I do different, um, do different things in the community. And, uh, and I've kind of gravitated at the moment. This is my public service activity. And, and then I do my, my work in the, in, in, the, in the business industry as well. Well, I know your wife, Tara, is also involved in the e public service. A absolutely. Uh, Girls Incorporated, she's uh, yep. active on that board. Yeah, Girls Inc., and she's a fabulous champion for uh, women and girls through that organization. It's a wonderful organization. Uh, and they have uh, locations across the state. Uh, she's also involved with the um, uh, International Institute, working with uh, New Americans. 
Uh, she herself is actually New American. She was born in Ireland. Oh, uh -huh. uh, so it's a lot of fun to get back and visit her family uh, and uh, experience that great country. And actually, my both of my sons, because of her birth there, have Irish uh, UK citizenship as well. Oh, is that right? Um, so uh -huh. it's a uh, <clears throat> you know it's it's a it's a wonderful tradition that that uh, that she uh, carries forward. Uh, and her parents moved here uh, from Northern Ireland, actually, which is you know an interesting part that they decided to leave. Northern Ireland because of the troubles, mm -hmm. uh, and start their economic future elsewhere. Uh -huh. But uh, but so she you know she's a fabulous person, and uh, <clears throat> and a leader, and she I don't know how she finds the time to make it all work, but she does. She just told me this morning that she got picked to be the uh, the classroom mom at our school in Manchester. So she really is uh, someone that does it all, and I certainly couldn't do what I'm doing here today or volunteer the way I'm trying to in the community without her tremendous support, and. Uh, Tara, if you're watching, I love you, and uh, thank you for everything that you do. You are the rock that uh, this is kind of all built on, so she's fantastic. Well, you're both distinguished. Uh, you've both been named to the Manchester Union Leaders uh, list of uh, top uh, young people under 40 uh, in the Manchester area, uh, both you and Tara, and that's quite an accomplishment. Maybe the only husband-wife team, I don't know. But uh, Well, actually, there's two people, so two, pe two new Bedford residents, uh, uh, E.J. Powers and, and, uh, and Gina Powers. Uh, they were a husband-wife ah. team that are on there, and, uh, but it is true that it is, uh, I think, an exclusive club, and I think goes just goes to show uh, how committed we are to this community. <clears throat> and, and how much this community offers us in terms of opportunity. Okay, well, we're about to uh, start discussing the Executive Council. Great, let's, uh, let's go. Although you have the such last... a rich background, we could have taken yeah. up the whole 28 minutes. Yeah, but, uh, but gonna... the one thing I'd mention uh, that I didn't, didn't mention before is that my current job is really exciting, and that's working with a Bedford resident, Dean Kamen, uh -huh. on the Advanced Regenerative Manufacturing Institute, which is trying to, as we brought, as Dine was really a catalyst for IT in the mill yard, now work, we're working to try and bring biotech really into the mill yard. And I'm excited to be working with him. It's a great uh, effort. And uh, if you haven't looked at it before, I encourage you to go check it out. It's really exciting and could help transform the New Hampshire economy in a lot of really important ways. Tara working in biotech or in, in she uh, does. at least medical tech anyway? Yeah, she works for a company called Hologic, uh -huh. uh, which does annual exam work. They the technology company behind these yeah. things. And they have a plant in Londonderry that she, uh, that she works at and uh, has worked there for over 10 years. So it's been a great spot for her. So you're the chief marketing officer of uh, Advanced Regenerative Manufacturing Institute, founded by Dean Kamen. Yes. And that's work that you're doing now. Yeah, and, uh, and I'll tell you, when I told him about this, uh, he said that I could have my nights and weekends back, um, but he expected, he expected every other weekend to be back working for him. So uh, it's going to be exciting to fit it all in, but it's really been tremendous to have his support, and, and it's been exciting to continue that work. Yeah. We've attracted a couple companies to, to Manchester, and uh, I think you know, are going to be able to make an impact for people and for wounded warriors, which is really at the core. You know, we got the money from the Department of Defense, <clears throat> and we want to make it uh, a lot easier for wounded warriors to come back and, and get uh, and be fully integrated, able to be, come back into society, and also able to, to redeploy, right? We want to make sure that we have the best health care uh, and the most uh, advanced therapies for, for our wounded warfighters. Yeah, wonderful. All right, uh, let's talk about the Executive Council. Let's first talk about what the Executive Council does. I think people, you know, aside from the governor himself, I don't think there's any more powerful uh, uh, position in, in New Hampshire state government. Uh, there's only five executive councilors. Uh, they have to approve every contract over $25,000 engaged by the state, and they have to approve all appointments by the governor. They're really a powerful position, and there's only five uh, uh, you would be running for Chris Pappas's ex job. Uh, he's 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 running for the, for Congress now. Uh, so tell us about your thoughts uh, about the executive council. Well, you know what, My, the idea for me to run for executive council really actually came from Chris. So <clears throat> I was doing a house party at my uh, or party at my house for him uh, in January, and he came at the end of it. He kind of came over and he said, "You know what, Craig? The, the executive council is such a. It's really the board of directors for the state." Uh, it's, a, it's a place where if you have business experience, you can really, you know, use that to help make the state run more effective, effectively and efficiently. And I said, boy, you know what, that's, that's really true. I hadn't thought about it that way, but it's very true. And like my dad uh, said, you know, when you have a chance to make an impact in New Hampshire, if you have a skill that you can volunteer, 
he was always a believer that you should. Mm -hmm. And so as I reflected on my business experience and how I might be able to help the state run more effective, effectively and efficiently, leverage technology better, in that position, I said, boy, this could be a unique uh, you know, connection between my skill sets and background and how I could help the state run. And so I was very excited about it. I learned more about the position, about its really role as the board. And I think what's interesting about that is having served on a lot of corporate boards and having served on, served on a lot of uh, nonprofit boards, that's a very exciting place to be. You know, you, you don't do the work, but you help set the execution strategy for, for the team. And I think working with the governor and working with, uh, you know, trying to, and the commissioner heads to execute more efficiently and effectively on the policy agenda that's been set by the legislature, that's really exciting. And, and I think the state has a lot of room to move when it comes to how it adopts technology to drive efficiently and effectively uh, the, the policy initiatives that are, that are set up by the, by the legislature. You know, it's clear from, from your background that when you look for people to be in your organizations, and I think this is something you'd probably bring to the executive council, you look for people who are proactive, who are energetic, who have an agenda that they would bring to office to bring their position and their function to a yep. higher level. Uh, and that's so important because the executive, executive council has to approve all of the governor's appointments. Um, and so talk about also uh, maybe the business, uh, the business dealings and how you would handle contracts which have to be approved by the executive council also. Yeah, you know, I think a couple of things that I talk about is, is really that there's two, uh, two, two fundamental roles of the executive council. One is related to hiring, right, picking the right people, and the other one is related to business deals. Uh, on, the, on the hiring side, I think that you've got to be uh, smart enough to look at the data, but brave enough to make change. Uh, you've got to have the fire in the belly, right, because nothing gets done without hard work. And, and you've got to have a, a commitment uh, and, and, and a set of experiences that are going to make you successful in the job. Mm -hmm. I think those are, those are important. Uh, you know, on, on the business side, does it drive innovation? Does it drive efficiency? Uh, will it get the job done? And, and I also think that a key thing to talk about here is really understanding how to coach and collaborate with the, the commissioners to make sure we're getting the most value. Because uh, as I've learned in business, sometimes it's the most expensive contract, sometimes it's the least expensive contract, but really what you have to do is understand what we're looking to get as a state and is that the most efficient and effective way to get it? And are we getting the best value? Because I think sometimes that question gets obscured and I think that's the exciting part about working with the commissioners to set the table. If you decide to paint a house you know, and you don't put metrics around you say, well, anyone that put one coat of paint on it, that's fine. And you get someone that's going to put two because they say it's going to last twice as long. Yeah. Right. you got to be able to ask these questions, and, and I think that's what I would bring to the table is a long history of a re and a really diverse history of working on business deals, making sure that uh, we're asking the, the, the tough questions, making sure that we're uh, you know, protected on the downside and, and have an opportunity at upside uh, for all of these different things that the state is doing, and, and really looking to leverage technology to make sure that we can be more efficient uh, and, and more effective. What was one of the great things about Dyn as we scaled, we knew that every new customer we brought on, we had to deal with more efficiently because we couldn't just add more people, right? You got to get more efficient as you grow. And, and I think that's the exciting part about where we are uh, in the state is there's a lot of opportunity to use technology to, to drive innovation and efficiency. One example that I've been talking about a lot is uh, everyone hates lines at DMVs, right? I sure do. And I was annoyed. And I said, well, why can't we have online appointment making, right? So I, I was talking about that with the state CIO and that's one of the things that I would focus on. It sounds simple, but it's one way for us to start making our experience with state government more efficient and effective, more like the private sector. And I'll tell you, when we look at that, uh, at the companies that I've been with, you can do that easily. You can do it for 12 bucks a month, right? So it doesn't have to be expensive to leverage some of these new technologies to make the way that the state serves its customers, taxpayers and citizens, more effectively. Let's talk about a couple of issues quickly uh, yeah. that I know the Executive Council has been central to in the last few years uh, and I know are very much uh, important to you. Uh, let's talk about Planned Parenthood funding. Let's talk yeah. about uh, women's health. Yeah, and I think you know, those are critically important. I, I've always believed that, uh, that women should make their own health care decisions and they should have the right to access health care, right? Full stop. And I think that any attempt uh, on the Executive Council to use it as a platform for partisan 
uh, hyperpartisan, uh, you know, uh, tax on that access is really inappropriate. And I think that we need to have someone who will fight for that and make sure that women continue to have that access that they do today. And, and that's honestly a difference between myself and, and the other person running for the office. He's pledged to, to kill that. Uh, and, and I've pledged that, no, I think that women should have access to that health care and, and deserve the right to make their own health care decisions. Now, the controversy in front of the uh, Executive Council over the past few years has been uh, commuter rail extension and infrastructure <clears throat> in general. So talk quickly about the uh, necessary investments that we need to make for infrastructure. Yeah, I will tell you this. It, it really could be a transformative economic opportunity for a southern New Hampshire to have rail from Manchester to Boston. And I, I think that it's a no-brainer that the studies have all said that. And, and right now there's, uh, you know, it, uh, there's work going on from a private company that's looking at it. I don't think it necessarily needs to be public or private. I think we need to have the commitment to get it done because it will truly transform the southern New Hampshire economy and benefit not just Manchester or Bedford or Nashua, but all the towns around us. And the entire district, uh, the entire District 4 would really benefit because of the jobs that would get created here because we have access to that broader talent pool. And as I've recruited businesses into the state, uh, whether it was IT or whether or now in biotech, I can tell you that that, that ability to have uh, commuter rail access to Boston is a key attribute and, and would be important for us to do. And, and I think one of the frustrating parts is, um, again, uh, you know, uh, my opponent in this race has said he's for it but doesn't know how we're going to pay for it. And from my perspective, uh, leadership is about uh, saying, if you believe in something, figuring out a way to get it done. And, and that's what I would be completely committed to. I, I'm not going to throw up my hands at a challenge. I, I'm going to roll up my sleeves and get the work done. Well, I think you've probably just done it, but you can quickly, we've got one minute left, uh, and you can maybe quickly just kind of uh, tell people how, you, how you're different from your, you're not a career politician, unlike your opponent, uh, but uh, why, tell us uh, just uh, why you, the citizens of uh, Bedford should vote for uh, uh, Gray Chenoweth for uh, executive counselor. Yeah, well, well, thank you for that. And, and I'm really excited to be here uh, with you and the, the citizens of Bedford to talk about this because I think it's a race between new ideas and the same old politics. And, and what I'm offering is a, a new agenda, uh, different ideas, new perspectives, and, and I think a next generation of leadership that can do more uh, to, to move us forward, to change uh, the things that we need to change to make sure that New Hampshire is efficient and effective in the way it prosecutes state government. And I think, you know, unfortunately my opponent, I know he loves uh, the, the city of Manchester, I know he loves New Hampshire, but I think that his record is not one that demonstrates he's going to be uh, that person that brings new ideas to the table and, and, and drives efficiency and effectiveness. I don't think he's going to be a champion for, uh, for women and their right to control their own health care decisions. And that's what I commit to. Uh, I commit to putting uh, partisanship aside, uh, to focusing on solutions, to listening to Democrats, and Republicans, and independents, to make sure that we get the best ideas, making our state run the best it can. So that's why I'm asking for your vote, and I'd love to consider, I'd love for you to consider voting for me on November 6th. Great. Thanks for coming into Candidates Corner. And thanks for BCTV, and uh, thanks for our voters for watching, and uh, be sure to vote at Bedford High School on November 6th. Thanks much. Thank you.